So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Good morning, some of you. How are you guys doing today? It is good to see you. It is good to be with you. Um, man, this is a good sight to see you. So many people here, uh, not just at church to be at church, but to celebrate the new life that we'll be celebrating in baptisms later today. And uh, hopefully you guys are here also to stick around with us this afternoon as we feed all of you uh, hungry, hungry, hungry hippos. Not uh, That's probably not a good start to be like calling people hippos before you talk to them. Um, I ask for a mulligan. Let me start over. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> But it is, it is good to be with you. And so if you are online and you are in the Clark County area, I uh, know you've got some time to make your way on down here. Uh, we've got fun, we've got games, we've got food, and it's just an opportunity to maybe hear some of the stories and meet some people here, uh, some of you that you haven't met before. Rob said jokingly, greet everybody. We can't do that in that short little time. But afterwards, after this service, there's an opportunity for you to get to know and meet some people, hopefully. And so uh, what's great is, uh, it's almost a joke now, because last year, remember, we did this service last year, and the temperature was like 100 and million point two degrees, and we had to move everything inside. And a couple weeks ago, we started talking about, hey guys, can you be praying for good weather? And then next thing you know, it's going to be triple digits again, potentially. And so we've had requests coming in all week long from people saying, hey, when the weather's really bad, can you guys just plan a barbecue? Whether it's in December or whatever it is, because it, it's like guaranteed whenever we want to do something like this, uh, it, it's smoking outside. So uh, we just hope uh, you guys are here to stick around for a while. So if you're new for the very first time, if you're here today because you're seeing somebody get baptized or you came for the, the, the festivities afterwards, we just want to welcome you and thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning and uh, adjusting your schedules. Those of you who regularly come at 9 or 11 to come at 10, we thank you guys for doing that. And so uh, today we're going to continue on in our sermon series as we walk through the book of Hebrews, and today we're going to be closing out chapter 6, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me, Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to be in verses uh, 9 through 20 this morning, and uh, if you were here with us last week, you remember we saw a pretty stern, direct warning uh, from the pastor who's writing this letter to this congregation. He kind of gave this direct warning to them saying, hey, don't be... Um, like those who have maybe experienced and been a participant of the family of God without actually ever becoming a participant of the family of God. Be, be attentive and alert that just because you might have some familiarity doesn't necessarily mean that you have a faith. And he, he kind of challenges them to do some introspective work to see where are they actually with Jesus? Do they love him for who he is, his character, his nature, apart from what he's done, but enjoying both of those things. And he, he had some more direct words for us last week. So he's confronted them, he's warned them, and now he expresses his confidence in them, and that's what we're going to be seeing today. So as soon as he says something kind of maybe makes some people uncomfortable in the argument that we'll see this morning, he transitions quickly to comfort them and express his own confidence within them. And so uh, this passage and this message is, I think, for all of us today, because I don't know if you've ever thought, does God really love me? Whether you're thinking of it now because you're going to get baptized later, does God really love me? Will he love me more because of what I'm about to do? Or maybe you're in here that thinking, does God really love me? I, 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 I maybe you said some things or I've done some things this week that I can't believe I, I did. It seems so out of character and out of nature of me. Does God really love me? If you've ever had anxiety or worried about those things, uh, asking yourself a question, does God really care? I think today is for you. If you've ever read through the scriptures and you've taken the time to see all the different promises and all the things that God declares and you wonder, I've seen those promises of God, but do they really apply to me or are they for somebody else? Today we would see that those things are for you. Because if there's anything I want you to walk away with this morning, whether you're new here for the first time or you've been coming to Summit View since its inception, I want to tell you this morning, you are not a lost cause. You indeed belong to God and your hope will not disappoint you for those of you who love and follow Jesus. So let's pray and we'll, we'll jump into the text. 
God of mercy, you promised to never break your covenant with us. And amid all the changing words of our generation, we ask that you would speak your eternal world to us that does not change. Help us to respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Read with me, starting in verse nine. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And so even as we we read that first verse in verse nine, he says, though we speak in this way, drawing us back to what we talked about last week of kind of assessing, are we somebody who's walking faithfully with Christ and embracing our identity in him? Or are we outside of that? Do we follow him and obey him and, and enjoy him forever? Or are we outside of that, not doing that? And he says, we could say that about others, but I'm not gonna say that about you. We could say that about others, but I won't say that about you because of the ways in which you've exhibited your faith and put it on display. And he he says a a, a term of endearment to them. He calls them beloved. And that's the only time that this word is used throughout the entire letter of Hebrews. And he's using it to really communicate a point that these individuals, these men and women, these children are truly not only just loved by him as their pastor, but ultimately loved by God. And so again, hammering that point home this morning that if you're with us this morning, that's what God would want to communicate to you, that you are an object of his love. It says that he's there to express love and care and affection. So it's not just of the pastor, it's not just of the people of the church, but God himself would call them and look at them and say, beloved, I've seen your faith. And he says, you've, you've exhibited these better things that belong to salvation, meaning that as he looks at their lives, look at what they have done, he sees that they were manifesting a relationship with Jesus Christ because they were bearing fruit in their life. They were expressing love in the name of Christ. And he says, we know that, we know this can be for sure because of the way that you've shown his name in serving of the saints. And so if you really know Jesus, it will be manifested in the way that you love and care for one another. And that's what he's saying. This is where my confidence comes from is as we, are, as we had that conversation last week of maybe there's some people that we can be uncertain about, but when I look at you, when I see your life, when I see how you're living and how you are modeling your faith, I could say with full confidence looking at you by the way that you serve the saints, we can have confidence in your faith. And what's amazing about this, he says that God sees it. So the love and service that you exhibit for one another, being Jesus, being supreme and central in your hearts, he says, by the way that you serve one another and love and care for one another in the name of God, we can have confidence in that faith. And so again, we we always want to stress the importance here when we consider what it means and what is required to be saved, whether it's faith plus works or faith, then works come later or works and then faith. Uh, Again, over and over again, what we see throughout the scriptures is that it's faith alone in Jesus Christ that saves us, that brings us into right relationship with God. However, works always come alongside with it after the fact in response to what God has done for us. Because our penalty has been wiped away, our our sin debt has been cleared, our our faults, our failures, our immoralities are taken care of by the cross, by Jesus. And when we have faith in that, we are so overwhelmed by affection for God and we are just so thankful for what he's done, we respond with service and care that God has shown us in Christ. And so the faith that we have never comes alone. And so this little church understood that. They got that. They were recipients of something so wonderful and great. They were motivated to serve and care for one another. And so the pastor sees this and then he acknowledges the work that they had previously done and encouraged them to keep doing so going forth. And so what an amazing encouragement it is for us this morning, for those of you who have been serving, those of you who have been devoted to his service I know it's so quick and easy in, in, in the church world when we're serving, whether we're in the kids' ministry or we're on the greeting team or we're on the hospitality team or there's even individuals outside cooking the hamburgers and hot dogs right now that aren't hearing this. We can quickly feel and think like, nobody sees this and nobody cares. Does it really matter? Does it make a difference? But what this passage is telling us is right here in verse 10, God is not unjust as to overlook your work. So for those of you who serve regularly and give of yourself to the care of the saints here at some of you, thank you. God sees it. He's not unjust to overlook it. And while man and people around you may not acknowledge it, we may not say it enough, know in confidence that God sees, that God knows. 
Even for some of you in this room, I can't begin to express my gratitude that I have that many of you took time off of work this week to go hang out with a bunch of junior high schoolers and high schoolers. I don't think you could pay me enough money to spend a week with all those kids. And some of you volunteered your vacation time to go serve and invest in, our, in, the, in the youth in this church. So thank you. It's, a, it's remarkable that you would give of yourself in that way. And then some of you showed up really early this morning to help set up tables and chairs and, and set out the bounce house, all the different things that we have going on here. Thank you. Your service is seen, and I hope that is, it is motivated out of a love for God and what he's done for you on the cross. For those of you who come every single week to, to fill communion and set it out for people to take communion every single week, thank you. And I hope you know that it's not just the people who are here on stage that are gonna be singing or, or talking that have a play and a role of people getting baptized or not, but every single one of you who use your gifts and use your service to love the church, to love the saints, have a hand in seeing these people getting baptized today. All of us who are using our love for God and serving, loving one another get to say we played a part in that. And it's really interesting if you think about it that the proof would be in the pudding, that if you love God, you would ultimately love others, right? Isn't that what our Lord Jesus taught us? If we think about love the Lord your God with all your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength, and what's the next thing he says? Love your neighbor as yourself. And the Apostle John picks up on this, and I want to, this is like a little pop quiz for you, so uh, we will raise hands if you get it wrong. We will, I don't know what we'll do. Um, maybe no bounce house for you, I'm kidding. Uh, so 1 John three fourteen says this, we know that we have passed from death into life, meaning that we have gone from the dominion of darkness, not following God, not loving God, not wanting anything to do with his ways, and we've come to life, we have come to light, we have come into right relationship with him because of what? What, what is that blank should that be? So it's quiet and I hear like murmurings like, oh, I, I said that, nobody heard me. But this is what that passage says. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. Meaning that our love, the way that we serve, the way that we care for one another, exhibits and puts on full display genuine faith. So whoever does not love abides in death. But some of us might be thinking, okay, what does exactly love look like? I think Michael, Pastor Michael, a couple weeks ago, was it Easter when we did the What is Love and he did the Night of the Roxbury dance? We turned that into a gif and uh, we will share that with you later on if you want to. Um, but when we think about what is love, is it just verbal affirmation? Is it just a pat on the back? Uh, pastor and theologian John Calvin says this and I think it helps summarize the idea of what, when we say love for the saints, what does that embody? It says this. We are not to spare ourselves from labor if we want to do our duty to our neighbors. We are not to help them financially only, but with advice and by our efforts and in all kinds of ways. We must show great zeal and put up with many annoyances. <laughs> I love how real that is. <laughs> you're like, people are like, Kyle, you're a great annoyance. Yes, you must put up with me to show you love me. <laughs> and sometimes undergo many hazards. Whoever wants to engage in the task of loving must be prepared for a laborious way of life. And so that's what the invitation is to making Christ your Lord is, is a way of loving him and loving others at a cost to yourself. And the pastor of this, as he's writing this letter to the Hebrew church, he's saying, this is what I'm seeing take place in your life. So there's confidence that I have within your faith. Because he even says in the passage, he says, as, as you still do, you are serving the saints as you still do in verse 10. So it wasn't just a passing moment. It was a routine and a habit for those who love God. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you're growing weary in your service, God sees, God acknowledges, God's appreciative and is thankful so that you would not grow weary in doing good. And he says, continue to do so. So the pastor there and the pastors and the church leaders here are grateful for those of you who are persistent and compassionate in your service. And again, all of that is couched, not just because we want to be moralistic, right people and altruistic and doing good things for the right people, but it says that they're doing it in verse 10 for his name. You're showing that love, you're showing that service for his name, for his glory. And so for some of you this morning, it might be an opportunity for you to reflect upon, are you serving in that capacity at cost yourself to the glory of God for his namesake, for the others? that your faith would be so on display for others to see that there would be no doubt at all that you truly love God. And then he goes on 
to say in verse 11, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators those through faith and patience inherit the promises. So he's saying, just as you've had that earnestness and desiring to seek, to serve, to love, to care, to provide for the needs, continue to do that as well in fully seeking and achieving, uh, not your salvation, but clinging tightly to it, that you would have the same assurance of hope for faith to the end. What is it that you hope for this morning? Do we hope for better weather later this week? Do we hope for a better year ahead, maybe with less sickness or difficulties or financial troubles? I know I hope every single year that the Mariners will break their playoff drought. Like 21 years running. It's, yeah, really, it's really, wow was right, it is very sad. Um, you think I would give up by now, but I'm a glutton for punishment. Is hope just wishful thinking for you? Optimistic thinking? What we see within this passage and that we would see all throughout the rest of the scriptures is that biblical hope isn't just this hopeful thinking for the future, but biblical hope is a confident expectation that what we want to come to pass will in fact undoubtedly come to pass. Now I'm not saying that I hope I'll live in a mansion and I'll eat you know, crab and steak and lobster every night for dinner. That's a good hope, but I don't think that's what the Bible's guaranteeing me. But there is this hope and expectation that we can have for those who belong to Christ Jesus, those who love him and those who have given their life to him have this absolute certainty of hope of knowing what's coming to pass in the future. And he, I love that he says that you would be, have a full assurance of hope. Not just a small measure, not just a teensy bit, but a full assurance You see, faith is something that has happened. We have faith in what has accomplished in the past and hope would be faith in a future tense. We know that what God has said of what is to come for those who love him, who love his people, who love their neighbors, have a certain hope of what's to come. And they're they're anchoring themselves to that hope as we see throughout this passage. And he says, do so by following and modeling your life after those and imitate those who have gone before you. And he begins to actually set an example for them as we see in the rest of the passage. And this is something that we actually get to see and study a little bit later on in the book of Hebrews when we get to chapter 11. But he says, follow a certain pattern of people's lives that have gone before you who have done this. So who are you looking to imitate and model your life after? And the pastor here brings up someone all in this little church would have been familiar with, and that's the person of Abraham. Read with me in verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. So the, the, the pastor here says that God had made a promise to Abraham and swore an oath to Abraham and Abraham waited on the Lord and to receive the promise. He believed and the promise eventually came to him. So he had hope in God's word. And so if you're unfamiliar with Abraham, he's, a, he's an important figure in the Old Testament and most of the New Testament refers back to Abraham in some way, in a way, because he's this individual that God, for some reason, out of the abundance of his grace and mercy, called out of, of a particular people and said, through you, I'm going to establish a great nation. You are, your offspring will outnumber the sands of the sea. You will be this individual in which my blessing and favor will be upon and on your entire family. And those who bless you will bless. Those who persecute you will, will persecute them. But he, he makes this promise to him, say that you'll have a land, you'll have this inheritance, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and I will walk with you. And he makes this promise to Abraham at this time when he's old in age, and he has no kids. So really, Abraham had no reason to trust and believe because again, at this point, he was a pagan who didn't necessarily worship and believe in the one true God, but God came to him and made this problem saying, hey, this is what's gonna happen and this is what's going to take place. And through a series of adventures, that promise is put to the test. And if you wanna read more about Abraham, you can read beginning and starting in Genesis 12 and reading through uh, the next 12 or so chapters to read that saga and that narrative of the ups and downs of how Abraham was faithful and then uh, stumbled and failed, yet God remained persistent in his promise to him. And so there's this idea of that Abraham, who was an imperfect man, 
even though he was looked upon in the, in the faith here, he was saying that he held closely to a promise that God brought to him. And he's saying, imitate yourself after that, holding tightly to the promise that we have received. And he says in there that God didn't just make this promise to him, but on top of it, he made an oath. He swore to him that he was going to do this. And we actually see this take place a few times throughout the book of Genesis, but one time in particular in Genesis 22, this is God speaking to Abraham after uh, some of the ups and downs. God says to Abraham this, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heavens and as the sand that is on the seashore. So throughout these different calls and these different invitations to follow God in ways that maybe seemed uh, ridiculous or outlandish or even crazy at times, Abraham faithfully followed after God, believing in the promise that he had and clung to that promise. And we see God saying, I will deliver on it because not only I gave you my word, but I made my word on my word. I swore to you. So Abraham had no empirical evidence at that time that God could or should be trusted. His word simply came to him and he acted in faith and built his life upon that hope. You see, when, when you or I make a swear or an oath, say in a courtroom, it carries a lot of weight of force. If you're sworn in to give some an account within a courtroom, if you lie, if you mislead, if you don't deliver on something, there is legal implications. So when we say somebody is making an oath, there's typically a guarantee there. And you and I get this, right? Because even since we were little children, we've always say, I swear, totally, I, I, I promise you, believe me. We say like, I swear on a stack of Bibles. I used to say that when I wasn't a Christian, like it would matter to me. Like I'm swearing on a stack of Bibles. I swear on my grandmother's grave. I swear on so-and-so's life. Let's shake on it. And if you're like a kid or like real manly, like you spit on it and then like that, that's, I never understood that one. We swear with pinky swears. You know, like, because if I break my swear and my oath to you and we do a pinky swear, you then get to break my pinky. Is that what it is, I think? <laughs> like, if we, I, I pinky promise and I don't come through and deliver, you get to break my pinky. We say things like, cross my heart, hope to die, stick stick a needle in my eye. So we make these ridiculous claims to say that I'm going to, you can trust what I'm saying. You can trust what I'm doing because I've made some particular oath or some particular promise. I've sworn on this that you could trust that I'm going to do what I'm doing. However, you and I both know that even on a human level, we sometimes falter. We sometimes break them. However, think of this. God wanting to make a promise swears on himself. He makes an oath on his own name to give strong encouragement. He didn't have to do this. God swears by himself because there's no one greater to swear by, right? Because that's what we say, like, I swear on this so-and-so. God's like, I can't swear on anybody else because there's nobody greater than me, so I guess I'll just swear on myself. I'll make an oath to myself, on myself, on my own character, on my own nature. The author picks up on this in verse 16. He says, for people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So again, think about that. You and I, when we make oaths, when we make pinky swears, we sometimes can be deceitful. But God's oath provides a certainty. Notice what it says in verse 17. It says, God desired to show more convincingly, meaning that God didn't have to do that. God continued to condescend to our level to communicate and speak with us in a way in which we needed. He's encouraging your faith that might be fragile. He gives a promise. He gives an oath, and he swears it to himself. So it's not just that God gave us his word, but he gave his word the word. He, he doubled down on it. It's almost difficult for us to parse out at times because God never deviates from his truth. When he says he's going to do something, he will do it. So he doubled down on it saying, I not only make this promise to you, but I make that promise on my name. Because you and I can give words to each other and sometimes we don't come through on them. However, what we see here in this passage, that's not the case with God. 
The promise of God should be guarantee enough, but he confirms it for his own sake, makes it doubly certain that we can have hope that God will do what he has promised to do. And so this is where the the rubber begins to meet the road for us as we consider this idea of of the certainty of our faith, the certainty of our hope in in Christ Jesus of a new life with him and, and overcoming sin and death and all those wonderful truths of the gospel. When we think about doubting our salvation or doubting does God love me, we, we have to kind of ask the question in one of two ways. Are we doubting it as in we're questioning our, 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 our beliefs and grasping for it? Or are we doubting it because we're doubting God's word and his promises? And I think there's a big difference there. There's one thing to say, I'm wrestling internally and I'm having a hard time reconciling some things within my life, so I'm doubting in that sense versus I don't quite truly trust and believe that God's word is true or his promise is certain. There's, I think there's a little bit of a difference there. Because what the pastor's saying to this little church and is saying to us this morning is that God's unchangeable character is fully on display, so there's no need to doubt his word. There's no need to doubt his character. There's no need to doubt his nature. So the certainty of a, of a better future uh, when Christ returns is for certain. The, the forgiveness of our sins in Christ is for certain. The newness of life with the indwelling of the spirit for those who follow him is for certain. Have you claimed tightly to that truth? It says continually and over and over again on there, just says that God Desire to show more convincingly, made a promise on his word so that we would know that God does not lie, cannot lie, will not lie. God's unchangeable from the day he created creation to the very end. Do you believe that? That his word still rings true today. You see, we live in a world of constant change. Anything and everything around us is constantly changing. You and I are constantly changing. So what is it that we look to hook ourselves to that is certain? Where do we almost drop anchor to say, this is where is my home base, this is my foundation, that I know everything else around me can change, the wind whirls can come, the winds can blow, the rain can come, but I'm immovable because I'm anchored here. And I know it's hard for us to wrap our minds around it at times because change is a part of life. But the truth of God's unchangeability is a beautiful truth to cling tightly to. In, in, a, in a book, Paul Tripp writes, writes about um, the, uncertain, the, the certainty of God's character, the certainty of God's nature of not changing and the, the way that it can comfort us. He says this. This is the hope that he's talking to of God's unchangeability that we are invited to believe in this morning. It says, whether on a given day you believe it or feel like it, you are eternally loved by God. When you are plagued by doubt, you are eternally loved by God. When his promises seem absent and he seems distant, you are eternally loved by God. By God. When his words seem dry and you find it hard to apply it to your life, you are eternally loved by God. On your best day and during your worst, darkest moment, you are eternally loved by God. When pride crushes gratitude, you are eternally loved by God. When you follow him with your heart filled with courage of faith, you are eternally loved by God. And that's the hope this pastor's trying to get at. Are you clinging to that? That is the full assurance of hope that you have, that knowing that those of you who've put your faith into Christ, those who are following after him, can know for absolutely certain you are eternally loved by God. He goes on to say in verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
weekend. We'll put a pin on Melchizedek. We've been teasing it for the last three weeks. Uh, uh, Brad Fennison, one of our elders, will be teaching that next week, and he asked me to stay out of his sermon, so I'm not even going to mention Melchizedek this morning. So if you're wondering if you've been on the edge of your seat for the last few weeks of Melchizedek, come next week. Brad has it all figured out. (laughs) But what the rest of the passage is talking about there is um, Hebrews uses this imagery of an anchor as a symbol of stability. That we can have a faith that is unshakable and secure because it is God's word that doesn't change, comes to us, God's promise that comes to us that he doesn't go back on, and God's oath concerning Jesus to bring us security into our lives. So if you are here this morning feeling lost, feeling caught up in the whirlwind, looking for a place of stability, the right place and the only place to find it is in Christ Jesus alone. And that's what you're actually going to be seeing later when people climb into the baptismal is that these individuals are proclaiming that their stability, their hope, their life, their love, all of their life, they're banking on and entrusting themselves to Jesus. That he's the stabilizing force in their lives. If you've ever been on a boat, whether it's on a lake, on an ocean, on a river, on a creek, a tributary, a bay, whatever body of water you would prefer to be on a boat on, your boat will have an anchor. And sometimes when you're out there, you could see straight down to the bottom because it's nice and clear water and you're thinking this is glorious, this is beautiful. However, if some bodies of water that you are on, you can only see the surface, you can only see the top and as you look down, it gets darker and darker and muddier and murkier and you're not sure how deep it goes. You're not sure what's underneath the surface. You're not sure what's all the way down there but you have confidence in this anchor you have that would throw overboard and it would sink down and it would anchor you to your position that despite how dark it gets or how murky it gets, with certainty, you know when you drop your anchor, you know for certain you won't drift. And that's what the pastor's encouraging us to do this morning, that we would have Jesus Christ as our anchor that keeps us stable, that keeps us tied, keeps us tethered to God, knowing that whatever comes, we won't drift. We won't float away. Jesus will help keep us stable. Amidst the waves and the storms, God will hold us steady. Do you believe that this morning? And he he makes this really interesting statement where he says that um, our hope has gone before, has entered into the place before the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner. Making this, uh, this statement of saying that like of all the things that have gone into the presence of God while we're still alive, the only thing that's there right now, currently part of the believer is our hope. And that's what keeps us tied and anchored, knowing that what's coming for us when, when Jesus will return and wipe away all this, the tears from our eyes and make all the sad things untrue and bring the right healing and the restoration for this world. We, we, we put our hope there and we cling tightly to that. It's almost as if, like, if you've ever been in a hospital for uh, uncertain circumstance, you know what it's like to sit in the waiting room waiting for somebody to come out and deliver good news. The surgery went the right way. Everything looks fine. Everything's going to be okay. What we could think of when we read this passage is saying that Jesus has gone behind the curtain. Jesus has gone into that operating room and he can come back to confirm to us that the word of God is true and God can be trusted. He's gone into the holies of holies. He's gone before God and made uh, atonement for our sins to bring us into right relationship with God. And he's affirming with his word saying, God can be trusted. Will you trust him this morning? Will you allow him to be the stability factor in your life? And so this doesn't mean that if you give your life to Jesus and begin to follow Jesus, your life won't be challenging or hard. Even for those of you who are getting baptized this morning, I hope you realize that even getting into these waters uh, doesn't necessarily guarantee an easy life from here. But you can have confidence for what happens after that that the God who eternally loves you and cares for you will see you through to the end. The great thing about this passage, uh, as it has impacted saints over the years and throughout the centuries, it has inspired different individuals to write songs. And one of the songs we regularly see, sing here at Summit View, or if you've grown up going to church, you've, you've probably heard the song, In Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. And there's two verses within that hymn that allude to this passage because the song says, when darkness seems to hide his face, 
I rest on his unchanging grace. Even when we're uncertain, can't see up from down, feel lost, feel confused, you can rest in his unchanging grace. The song continues, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. You're probably thinking like, how does a veil hold an anchor? Like a wedding veil and an anchor, that doesn't seem like that could do it. That's not what it's getting there. But the idea that we have such certainty in who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished for us that whatever storms may come, wanna toss us, we can remain tied and anchored to God because he has got us. A song continues, his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. So this morning, if you're joining us, maybe for the first time, and you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian yet, what I would invite you to consider as we wrap up the rest of our service today with with communion, with baptisms, uh, with celebrations, that you would maybe consider these individuals' lives of who have saying that they are, are wanting to imitate uh, people of faith. Maybe you would begin to look to them and imitate your life after theirs. That you would see these individuals climbing into the baptismal saying they are putting their hope, their trust, they're banking their future, all these things on Christ. And maybe you haven't done that yet in your life. But maybe today is one of those days that you consider to do just that maybe to turn from all the different things that you've been looking for to provide you stability, whether it's a good paying job, a happy family, all the right vacations. But is that enough to hold your soul in the darkest of nights? Is that enough to keep you in peace? Because I would submit to you, if, if there's anything that you're anchoring your soul to that it is apart from Christ Jesus, that'll ultimately let you down that'll ultimately lead you astray. So I would ask you to consider your faith this morning as we see others making proclamations of their own faith this morning. And you can have certainty that if you make that decision, if you, if you cr- come to that point of faith, God's character is good. God's word is true. And you, in fact, are eternally loved by God. Let us pray. God, only you alone can bring into order our unruly wills and our unruly hearts and our wild affections. We ask right now that you would grant your people grace to love what you command and to desire what you promise that among the swift and very changes of the world, our hearts may surely be fixed where true joys are to be found. And that is only in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lived and died and rose again and now reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen.